Good morning. Oh, I didn't say. Oh, good morning, everyone. Hey, Bob, sit down, would you? Robert. And here comes Maureen. Where is he? Mr. Barrett. Oh, good morning. Good morning, good morning. Hey, Donna, did you bring any cookies? Coffee cake? Okay, good. Did your wife show up today? <laughs> what is going on here? Cheryl, you better get over here. You better get over here. Oh, good morning, everyone. Is anyone interested in golf today? Wow. How about that golf course in Florida? Man, they have a uh, tour. Have you ever, ever played Tour 18? Oh, it's hole number nine. It's the same. I can, I can drop it in the lake there, too. It's not too difficult. Hey, Bob, Robert, Ron. Have you played uh, the player? But, but Tour 18, I bet you can do the same thing at hole number nine, right? Okay, good. Hello, Mary Jane. So we need to have a, uh, welcome our guests. We have, we have some guests right over here. Are you gonna introduce them, Bob? Morning. Hello, 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 hello. <laughs> good morning. <laughs> um, hopefully, Everybody got the email I sent a day or two ago about the Gospel Lakes event coming up next weekend. We've had several volunteer, but we need probably four or six more people to sign up. So if you can and are willing to help with the Gospel Lakes lunch, please let me know ASAP. Um, we need to get a count so we can get going. Um, also, CMC needs everything, uh, including refried beans, uh, but remember that. Mostly I wanted to introduce Kirsten Bradley. She's going to give us a few minutes. 7.30. Okay. Those going to uh, Gospel Lakes will have breakfast at Cracker Barrel and Conroe at 7.30 and then caravan from there. So there's an incentive. <laughs> okay. Kirsten Bradley is with uh, a ministry called uh, Finishing Touch Touches. Um, I, <laughs> I I just met Kirsten a couple weeks ago at uh, Ministry Day. Uh, Wanda introduced us, and I found her information was very fascinating, interesting to me. I thought it might be interesting to others. Uh, I think perhaps there are other people in this group who can help them. So, Kirsten. Good morning. Bridget Johnson is with me. You may recognize her as the daughter of Anna Leo Benishek. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> How many of you have heard of Finishing Touch Ministry? A few. Okay. Good. Great. Well, I'm the community relations person for Finishing Touch, and Bridget and I work together uh, on a team, and I'll tell you a little bit about us. We are a gospel-focused 501c nonprofit organization, completely volunteer. There are 56 of us, and that consists of 38 ladies and 23 men that we call our blessing builders. Let me rephrase it. 38 ladies, 32 men. I guess I'm dyslexic this morning. Um, and the men are our blessing builders, and my husband is a blessing builder. So any of you men that have some extra time on your hands and you would like to volunteer in our warehouse, I left flyers back there for you. So that's right. We would love to have you. So we work out of a donated warehouse space over off of 249. Uh, it's about 5,000 square feet stacked three high. <laughs> and our warehouse is open for donations on Wednesdays and Saturday mornings from 9 to 12 on both of those days. If you have an opportunity to drop um, any furniture off or decor, I'll tell you a little bit about that too. But we also pick up furniture as well. 
and there, there are flyers back there that take you directly to our website. We'll give you even more information. We are sponsored by Champion Forest as well, so we're part of the ministry team here. Now, what do we do? So in a nutshell, we take a completely empty space and we turn it into a fully furnished, personalized home for someone. And when I say that, I mean everything. Sheets, towels, everything they need to walk in and start cooking. Um, just everything that you need to have in your home. We provide that for someone else as well. So a client would leave a, an empty space in the morning and they come home to a fully furnished, fully furnished home and it's done in one day. Whether it is a studio apartment or whether it is a transitional living home with five to six bedrooms. We've done them that big as well. Um, they come home not only to a beautifully decorated home, but they come home to a home cooked meal and fresh flowers and homemade cookies. Um, so it's, it's pretty amazing. I, it's overwhelming, I will tell you, when they walk in the door. Many are speechless and many just cry the whole time. So the neat thing is you can follow us on Facebook and Instagram and we post a story for every single person or transitional living space that we bless. So you can follow their journey, you can learn more about them and how they came to Finishing Touch in the first place. Uh, another blessing is, let's say you donate some furniture or decor. You, when you follow us on um, social media, you can go, oh, that's the couch I donated. There's my vase. Or there's that lamp that's been sitting in the closet for six months, which by the way, I want that lamp. If it is sitting in your closet, whether it's a throw pillow, a lamp, whatever, we can repurpose it and then turn around and use that to bless somebody else. That's, that was my next one. Who do we serve? You might be wondering, where do we get these clients? Well, we get them from a lot of the very same people that Finishing Touch, I mean, that Champion Forest sponsors. For example, Mission of Yahweh. Uh, sharp and Sober Living, Redeemed Ministry, and many more. So our clients come from a bunch of different backgrounds. Abused women, sex trafficked women, retired missionaries, veterans, um, people in transitional living that have come through some type of alcohol or drug addiction. And what we are looking for in our clients, though, is not necessarily a hand out, a hand up. We want to see that they are working hard. We want to see they're going to school, that they want a better life for themselves or their children because we want them to break the cycle of poverty and we're helping them get on their feet. But one thing that they all have in common is they've been able to get to that point where they have a place to live, but they have no way to furnish it. Can you imagine starting from scratch and have nothing? Um, so anyway, we get to work with a lot of different people. go on too long. So just a few quick statistics. To date, we have done over 250 blessing days. This represents over 250 lives that have been changed. The opportunity for these clients to see the life-changing power of Jesus Christ and how God loves them and how God pursues them. And we share the gospel from start to finish uh, with each of our clients as well. This also represents hundreds of children, many of whom are sleeping on a mattress for the very first time, or um, a, new, a new mattress or not just something that their parents picked up from a dumpster somewhere. So how can you help and why am I here? Uh, like I said, if you've got decor stashed away, Wanda has been amazing to us. She has donated some lovely, lovely things. Um, and if you have some items, please reach out and let me know. We will pick those up. You can drop them off at the warehouse. Um, another thing, if your class is interested, y'all could sponsor an item. We always need crosses. We always need sheets. We always need towels. You could sponsor a kitchen box or a bedroom box or a bathroom box and then supply everything that's needed, like you know, shower curtains, towels, things like that. You guys can be creative and call us up and say, we have a creative idea and this is, would this work for your group? Um, so, any questions? Anybody have any questions? Bridget, do you want to add anything? Um, I just want to say that I got a, I became a part of this ministry. I do decorative painting, and so I was asked, well, hey, because we do a lot of stuff that sometimes needs a little bit of tweaking or a little bit of, I don't know. Love. Needs a little, needs little love. love. Yeah. And so, <laughs> anyway, this lady that knew that I painted was like, hey, you should be a part of this ministry. So, I was like, okay, you know. 
So I got to be a part of this ministry. I will tell you, this is the most God-loving women and men that you could be a part of. Like, it is such a blessing to be a part of women that just truly just go into all the little details. They find out the littlest thing that a, a mom that has just been down and out, you know, like her favorite color and just, I mean, just the littlest things. And they just try to go in to where it's just those little God winks for the client that day that was just like, oh my gosh, I can't believe. I remember a lady we did one for and she got, we gave her a waffle maker. It was a random thing. I don't even know that we ever had got one before. And anyway, she saw the waffle maker, which meant nothing to us, but it meant everything to her because she was wanting to open a, uh, like a deli or something and do some kind of waffle sandwich. And she just like freaked out. We were all like going like, what the heck, you know? <laughs> but it's little moments like that that you have with clients that you're like, God knew that that was something that would mean something to them. So Absolutely. we've just, we've had lots of those and it's amazing the things that will get donated and we're kind of like, eh, but we'll end up using it, you know? So We could stand up here all day and tell you yes, stories yeah. about the clients. Um, but one thing that you could definitely do as a class is to please pray for us. And I'm going to give you a couple prayer requests that the Lord would lead us to the people that he desires for us to bless because this is the Lord's work. We want to be his hands and feet. That the Lord will use finishing touch to magnify him in every single aspect of what we do. And that each client, our desire is that each client would come to know Jesus Christ is their Lord and Savior. Um, and like I said, we share the gospel from start to finish. And we circle back to every client at Christmas time, take them a nativity scene, homemade cookies, and check in on them. And many of them reach out to us throughout the year to ask for prayer and to update us on how they're doing. So it's amazing ministry. Thank you for your time. I really appreciate you guys. And Bob, where's Bob? There's Bob. Thank you, Bob. And Wanda. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, you, uh, you guys obviously knew that today was St. Patrick's Day. You both have green on, right? And so do you remember if you don't have green on, you get pinched, Ken? That doesn't count. All right. Ken, Ken and I are together. We got, we got the green here on our badge, okay? So great, great hymn that we're going to talk about this morning and sing about is Pass Me Not, O Gentle Savior one of those great Fanny Crosby hymns. And it was actually one of the first hymns that she became internationally known for because um, Dwight L. Moody and Ira uh, Sankey picked up the song and sang it on their European uh, uh, crusades. So Fanny went to a uh, prison one day, her and a couple of friends, one was William Doan, and they talked about some of the songs that she had written and they sang several of those songs and toward the end as she began to sit down she heard one of the prisoners say and i'm going to read it he said good lord do not pass me by william doan looked at her and said i think there's a song in that and like some of these great songwriters she wrote it that night the whole thing sat down and wrote it so when god inspires you know this is an inspired ministry we just heard about when God inspires somebody like that, I mean, gives them the gift, and then she sat down and wrote that. And like, unfortunately, like a lot of songs that we even hear today, somebody found issue with it. Because there's a, the verse, first verse is going to talk about, uh, Pass me not, O gentle Savior, hear my humble cry. While on others thou art serving, do not pass me by. Some people said, well, that's, the Lord would never pass that person by. But you've got to look at this in the way she did in the eyes of that prisoner who had no idea of the love of our Savior, that he would not pass them by. So actually, she rewrote that to make it a little bit less offensive to some. But when you hear a song like that, it's good just to understand a little bit about why it was written and what it means to the songwriter and to the person. I don't know if that prisoner ever heard that, but my, my faith is that he found out that Jesus didn't pass him by. So let's sing, Pass Me Not, O Gentle Savior. Pass me not, O gentle Savior, hear my humble cry. While on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. Savior, Savior, hear my humble cry. 
while on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. Let me at a throne of mercy find a sweet relief. Kneeling there in deep contrition, help my unbelief. Savior, Savior, hear my humble cry. While on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. Trusting only in thy merit, would I seek thy face. Heal my wounded, broken spirit, save me by thy grace. Savior, Savior, hear my humble cry. While on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. Amen. Ooh. Oh, oh, we're going to do the, here we go. I'm sorry. I was done. Y'all want to sing the fourth one? All right, let's go. I sing of good my comfort, more than life to me. Whom have I on earth beside thee? Whom in heaven but thee? Savior, Savior, hear my humble cry. While on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. Sorry about that. I told y'all I'm a lifelong Baptist. We only sing three verses. I don't care how many <laughs> verses were in the song. Thank you. Guys. Hey, that's how I feel all the time with Ken here. Okay, Ken, are you ready? I, I just said, are you ready? Yes. Okay, come on up here. Okay. Hey. Oh, hold on just a second. Sit it. Okay. Right. Great. That's fantastic. Okay, Ken. Okay. You know, Ken is one of my favorite people. Oh, yeah. <laughs> there really aren't any others. What do you want? <laughs> hey, we really, really, we really do love you. I don't care what you say. <laughs> Let's pray. Okay. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this uh, special time to be in your house. Our Father, thank you for uh, the blessings that we've heard today. Our Father, we pray that you'll be with uh, Ken now as he leads us. Thank you for Joyce and Diane and their leadership. These things we ask in thy name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Basil. How many of you have had allergy problems in the last two or three weeks? Boy, about every hand. In the... Maureen and I have had it now for, what, for nearly three weeks. <clears throat> and uh, I was just, yesterday I was coughing like crazy. She said, what are you going to do when you're teaching tomorrow and you start coughing? I said, I'm just going to stop and I'm going to let Basil finish. <laughs> And she said, well, most people will leave the room. And I said, that's the idea. <laughs> anyway, I've got my water and I've got a cough drop. And if I do start coughing, just bear with me. Well, I'm going to read you a little story. Um, Y'all ever watch Forrest Gump? Everybody watched Forrest Gump. Well, when Forrest Gump died, he stood in front of St. Peter at the pearly gates. And Peter said, uh, welcome, Forrest. We've heard a lot about you. He said, unfortunately, we're, it's getting pretty crowded up here, and we have to find, we find now that we have to give some people an entrance exam before we let them turn, get in. Forrest said, okay, I hope it's not too hard. I've already been through a test. My mama used to say, life is like a final exam. It's hard. Yes, Forrest, I know, but this test has only three questions. Here they are. Which two days of the week start with T? Second question, how many seconds are there in a year? Third question, what is God's first name? Well, sir, said Forrest, the first one is easy. 
Which two days of the week begin with the letter T? Today and tomorrow. <laughs> St. Peter looked a little surprised and said, well, that wasn't the answer I was looking for, but you have a point. I'll give you credit for that answer. Well, the next question said for us, how many seconds in a year? Twelve. Twelve? How do you get twelve? He said, well, January 2nd, February 2nd, March 7th. <laughs> He stopped him. He said, okay, I get your, get your grift. He said, I'll give you credit for that one too. But here's the last one said for us. What is God's first name? His first name is Andy. Andy? How in the world did you come up with Andy? For us said, I learned it in church. We used to sing about it all the time. He broke into song and said, Andy walks with me. Andy talks with me. Andy tells me I'm his own. St. Peter opened the gate and said, Forrest, run on in. Now, the only thing that that has to do with our lesson, I want to thank Catherine, Don, and Nancy for the great job they do, not only in leading our music, but Catherine is a big help to Diane and Joyce and I picking songs that uh, fit our lessons and so forth. So I want to thank you all publicly. <laughs> and that's what Forrest Gump was all about. Well, we all have dreams and ambitions in our lives. And in the process of, of chasing our, our dreams and our desires, we're always faced with a choice of doing it God's way or doing it in a way that we choose to do, use devious means to get to the end point. And many times people reason that as long as the end result is a good result, they can do whatever they want to to achieve that goal. I think probably most of us remember a popular song that was popularized by Frank Sinatra back in 1969 called My Way. You ever hear that song? Yeah, yeah okay, good. Well, this morning, we're going to look at Genesis chapter 27, and we're going to look at a dysfunctional family that did it their way. They did not do it God's way. Last Sunday in Genesis chapter 25, we saw the beginning of this dysfunctional family. Isaac and Rebekah had twin boys, Esau and Jacob. Esau was born first, but right behind him, Scripture says that Jacob was born grabbing and holding on to Esau's heel. So when the boys grew up, Esau was an outdoorsman. He was a hunter. He was a man. Jacob was the quiet one. He was kind of the homebody, as Diane said last week. In chapter 25, it also says that Isaac loved Esau and Rebekah loved Jacob. That's a good start for a dysfunctional family, picking and choosing which child you're going to love more than the other. We also saw in chapter 25 that Esau, the oldest, had the first rights to the inheritance of his father, Isaac. And we saw Esau foolishly selling his birthright last week to his younger brother for a simple bowl of stew. So with that, I want to this morning take a closer look at this home of Isaac and Rebekah. And throughout chapter 27, we're going to see that their home was not really based on biblical principles, relationships, or responsibilities. At the very beginning of this chapter, we see that the family, although they were not totally what they should be, at least they were together. However, by the end of the chapter, we're going to see that that family was totally destroyed, torn apart. So let's take a look at the personalities that make up this family of four people. First of all, we're going to look at the father, Isaac. We're going to call Isaac the irresponsible father or husband. You know, a father should be responsible one, be the responsible one in their home. A biblically functional family begins with a husband and a father. They perform the roles and the responsibilities outlined in the scriptures. A father is supposed to be the provider protector, and living a godly life and an example for his children. A perfect example of that was Abraham, Isaac's dad. Genesis, back in chapter 18, verse 19, says, For I, this is God speaking, For I have chosen him, Abraham, that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteous and justice, so the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has promised to him. And we talked about that promise that he gave Abraham a couple of chapters ago. But as we look at Isaac in this passage, it's clear that his father Abraham 
not, unlike his father Abraham, he was neglecting the responsibilities as the true leader of his family. So let's look at chapter 27. Starting in verse number 1, we'll look at the first two verses. <clears throat> verse 1 says, When Isaac was old and his eyes were dim, so that, he, so that he could not see, he called Esau, his older son, and said to him, My son, and he answered, Here I am. He said, Behold, I am old, and I do not know the, uh, the day of my death. So he was getting older. He obviously couldn't see. His eyes were dim. And he was wanting something from his son. He was anticipating his death, so he called his oldest son, Esau, and made a request of him. We see it in verses 3 and 4. Verse 3 says, Now then, take your weapons, your quiver and your bow, and go out into the field and hunt game for me, and prepare me delicious food such as I love, and bring it to me so that I may eat, so that my soul may bless you before I die. Well, what was this blessing that Isaac wanted to give to Esau? Again, we have to go back in Genesis to chapter 17. God gave the covenant blessing to Isaac's father, Abraham. The covenant simply said to Abraham that he would have many offspring. He would have many nations that would come out of his lineage. And that the, descent, the covenant would extend to his descendants, descendants, physically and spiritually to his children. And that God would give his sons and daughters the land of Canaan. Great promise. Great blessing. As the son of Abraham, Isaac was to inherit that blessing. And he did. And when Isaac was looking forward and anticipating that he was going to die, as was the custom, Esau, the oldest son, would in fact inherit that. But now he's old. He's frail. He's essentially blind. He called Esau and he sent him out to hunt some wild game because he liked wild game that Esau killed and prepared for him. So let, let's pause for just a moment here and look at something really important that we need to remember through the rest of the chapter. It's, it also comes, back, comes from back in chapter 25. Before these twins were born, God spoke to Rebekah in chapter 25, verse 23, and she said this, Two nations are in your womb. And two peoples are within you, and they shall be divided. And the one shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. Really important point as we go forward. Now, in spite of God's message to Rebekah, which undoubtedly Isaac had some idea of, Esau, the oldest, would serve Jacob. Very unusual. And Isaac was determined, in spite of what God said, to issue his blessings to be passed on to that oldest son, even though that wasn't a part of God's plan. So Isaac was living in a bit of denial of both the word of God and the will of God. And he planned to give es Esau the blessings in deliberate defiance of God's will. So here we have these two sons that are competing for that same blessing, all because of the failure of Isaac, the father who was not living up to the father that God wanted him to be. So back to our story. Isaac conspired in secret with Esau to hide his plan to bless Esau from Rebekah and Jacob. He wanted his favorite son to have the blessing, and he had to scheme in order to make it happen. And that's exactly what he would do. If he had to deceive his wife and his other son, he said, so be it. If he had to disobey God, which in fact he did, that is what he would do. So Isaac had walked away from God in his later years. When he was younger, that wasn't the case. He was quick to seek the Lord in his younger days and intercede for his wife and his home when it was needed. But here we find a once godly husband and a father now behaving irresponsibly. So second, let's take a look at the mom, Rebecca. We're going to call her the manipulative mother. As we saw, Isaac's plan was to bless Esau and not something that he shared with his wife, Rebekah. And why didn't he do that? Well, Isaac knew that Rebekah wouldn't like the idea because she had other ideas. This was a house divided. It was kind of like a group of uh, Texas Longhorns living with a group of Texas Aggies. 
They were totally divided. And because Isaac favored Esau and Rebekah favored Jacob, there was a great wall of indifference and secrecy between them. Rebekah just happened to overhear what Isaac had said to Esau. You probably remember, as parents, if we're not careful, children can divide and conquer. They know how to pit one parent against the other so that they're free to do and get what they really want. And they know which, per which parent to ask when the other parent is not there for something that they really want. So as fathers and mothers, we need to be always be very careful and on the same page, talking together, praying together, working together for good of the children. That certainly wasn't the case in the household of Isaac and Rebekah. Well, when Re Rebekah heard, overheard Isaac's plan, she had some options. She could do some different things. Even though Jacob was her favorite, she still had the promise of God to fall back on. He said that Jacob was the one to get the blessing. That was God's word, and it was his will. She could just believe in that. She could confront her husband about this and maybe work something out. Or she could ask the Lord for wisdom. What should I do? As a younger woman, she did seek wisdom from God in prayer, and the Lord was gracious to give her insight into her situation. The New Testament, James chapter 1, verse 5, speaking of wisdom, says, any, If any of you lack wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. So Rebecca had some options. The Lord could have caused Isaac to experience a change of heart in all of this. There's really nothing too hard for the Lord. God has a thousand ways to answer every prayer. But instead, Rebecca immediately began to plot and scheme to get her way. She asked Jacob, the younger son, to go out and get two young goats so that she could make a meal for Isaac. Jacob could then take the food to Isaac, trick him into giving him the blessing instead of Esau. But by doing this, Rebecca misused her own parental influence and authority. Verse 8 says, Now therefore, my son, obey my voice as I command you. Pretty strong. I want you to do this. Rebecca puts Jacob in a pretty difficult situation. He's faced with either disobeying his mom or disobeying his dad, pleasing his mom or pleasing his dad. And that's a tough place to be. <clears throat> Verse 13 says, His mother said to him, Let your curse be on me son, me, son. Only obey my voice and go and bring them to me. Jacob was a little afraid of what he was about to do. What if I get caught? And his mother said, Let it be on me. I'll take care of that. Clearly, Rebecca was the dominant leader in the family. She was strong. She was resourceful, decisive, and cunning. And it appears that Isaac had relinquished his position as a spiritual leader to his wife, either because of her dominance or because of his own inability to do so. And after all, it was Rebecca who thought about doing this deceptive practice. It was Rebecca who told Jacob, go out and get some food. It was Rebecca who said, put on the lambskin on your arms so they'll be hairy, so they'll be like I would be like Esau. At every point, she was in charge. She always had an answer for every question and a solution to every problem. So Rebecca truly was a manipulative mother. And then we'll look at Jacob, the dishonest son. Jacob was the weak one. As we said, he was a homebody. He offered no resistance when his mother demanded that he do what she asked. Look at verses 11 and 12. But Jacob said to Rebekah, his mother, Behold, my brother Esau is a hairy man, and I am smooth. Perhaps my father will feel me, and I shall be mocking him and bring a curse upon myself. Jacob really wasn't offering, uh, he wasn't, even, uh, wasn't operating on principle. He could have said, This is not right. This is deceit. I would have to be telling a lie to my father. But he didn't do that. Willingly, he became a part of that conspiracy, and he went and did what his mother asked, and he lied to his dad. 
You know, in our lives, we should always operate by what is right according to what God teaches. We should never operate on the basis of the whatever the situation might demand at the time. We should never be driven by the urgency to make a decision solely on the basis of time or some pressure that's put before us. We should never make decisions based on what others in authority might ask of us. It really doesn't matter what everybody else is doing. Remember when your kids said, well, everybody's doing it. The criteria for our decisions and conduct are to do what is right in God's eyes. We are to be people of principle. The end will never justify the means. I think Jacob may have said to himself something like this. I know that God wants me to have this blessing. So if I have to cheat a little bit to get it, you know, God's going to understand. So I'll just go ahead and do it. But he was wrong. Jacob got what he wanted. That part of it was right. But God did not approve of the method that he went about to get it. Next, let's look at verses 18 through 20. Is that 18? I can't see that far. There we go. Verse 18 says, So he went to his father and said, My father, and he said, Here I am. Who are you, my son? Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done as you told me. Now set up and eat my game that, it, that your soul may bless me. But Isaac said to his son, How is it you have found it so quickly, my son? He answered, Because the Lord God granted me success. You know, it's so easy sometimes to call our will God's will. It may, if we try to justify what we want by just including God's name in it to cover up our actions, usually the end will be that we'll only get in trouble. But Jacob, we've, in Jacob, we find a believer, but he is absolutely an undisciplined, principled believer. And then we have that fourth member of the family, Esau. We're going to call him the losing son. After Isaac finished blessing Jacob, which he did, he assumed that Jacob was Esau. He gave him the blessings. He ate the stew or the meat. After he finished, Esau then came in. Look at verses 33 through 35, I believe it is. Is that what's on you there? I can't see that far. No, it back. They need to make that bigger back there. <laughs> or I need to be younger. Maybe that's it. <clears throat> okay, verse 33. Then Isaac trembled very violently and said, what was it then that Who was it then that hunted game and brought it to me? And I ate it all. You came, and I have blessed him. Yes, and he shall be blessed. As soon as Esau heard the words of his father, he cried out with an exceedingly great and bitter cry and said to his father, Bless me, even me also, my father. But he said, Your brother came deceitfully, and he has been and he has taken away your blessings. You know, it's a strange sight to see a strong man as probably Esau was breaking down in tears. He begged his father for another blessing. It was a sad and tragic moment in the life of Esau, but we have to remember that it was him who caused the consequences of his own decision. He willingly sold his birthright to his brother for this bowl of stew. And now suddenly Esau is living more than just in the moment. His blessings meant that something would be there for him in the future, and now that's gone. It's too late. And then Isaac, a couple of facts hit him immediately. First of all, that younger son of mine deceived me, and he could not bless the favorite son that he really wanted to bless. Once the blessing was given, it couldn't be retracted. It was like a contract, could not be revoked. Esau attempted to seek sympathy and excuse his actions by placing the blame on Jacob. Verse 36, Esau said, Is, it not, is he not rightly named Jacob, for he cheated me these two times? He took away my birthright. And now behold, now he has taken away my blessings. Then he said, have you not reserved a blessing for me? Well, Esau had a short memory. He had forgotten his part in selling his birthright. 
You know, we can blame others for the sins that we commit. We can try to rewrite history, but God knows all and sees all. He's the final judge. Isaac did not attempt to reverse himself. Perhaps Isaac by this time was convicted and finally surrendered what the plan was all along that God gave that Jacob should in fact have the blessing. Verse 37, Isaac answered and said to Esau, Behold, I have made him Lord over you and all his brothers. I have given him for servants and with grain and wine I have sustained him. What then can I do, my son? You know, there's always consequences to sin. When we're rebellious, disobedient, we lose something that we just can't get back. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 17 says, For you know that afterward, when he, speaking of Esau, desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no chance to repent, though he sought it with tears. Now in the full weight of what has happened to Esau, we find him in a bad situation. Have you ever made a mistake <clears throat> that had such serious consequences that literally you would pay anything or do anything to go back and undo what you did? You know, maybe, maybe you had some savings and you invested in what you thought was a sure deal and it went south and all of a sudden you were bankrupt. Maybe you had a family situation where you had a big fight and it got so ugly that even after many years, there's that hurt that is there still. Or maybe a sin that we've committed that changed our entire life. We lost a lot of our friends, family, because of that sin. I guess there's no feeling worse than the feeling when we're faced with the consequences of that kind of event. And I think that's the way Esau must have felt. But Esau caused that problem. If he had properly controlled his senses and valued his birthright, Jacob could have never have tricked him out of that. Look at verse 41. Now Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing with which his father had blessed him. And Esau said to himself, The days of mourning for my father are approaching. But when that's over, I'm going to kill my brother. Esau held a judge against Jacob because of the blessings his father had given him, and his hatred for his brother reached the point that he literally wanted to kill him. So it's at this point Rebecca steps back into the picture, and we see the second manipulation from Rebecca. She told Jacob to run for his life because Esau was planning to kill him. She advised him to go to her uncle, Labron in Haran, which was about 500 miles away. Now, this mama knew her sons. She knew that es Esau had an impulsive tendency. He had a temper, but she also knew that his temper would ease after a while. So she sent Jacob away, thinking that maybe he'll stay away for a few weeks or a few months, and then he can come back when Esau settles down. Little did she know that Jacob would spend the next 20 years away. But that's another story. One final detail of Rebecca's manipulation. She had to find a way for Jake to tell, uh, to justify sending Jacob to Haran. So she told Isaac that I don't want him marrying in this Hittite situation. I want him to find a wife from our own family. So I want him to go to my uncle's. In effect, she was giving Isaac a cover story, if you will. She manipulated Isaac again, and Isaac agreed. Calling Jacob to his side, he blessed him and sent him off to Haran. Now, Jacob had what he wanted all along. He, can, he obtained it through fraudulent means, but he had what he wanted. He had the blessing. He would pay a heavy price, and he would suffer consequences for that. You know, he fled his home in fear. It cost him his family. He was penniless. He was homeless. He was fleeing for his life. He was estranged from the entire family, particularly his twin brother. He had humiliated his father. And as far as we know, Scripture never tells us that he saw his mother ever again. Because Jacob left 
and Esau stayed home, Jacob forfeited all the material things that could have been his through this inheritance if he had just stayed home. He got what he wanted, but he got it at a price. So what we see here is a family that in the very beginning was barely holding together and by the end finally collapsed under the weight of deception and dishonesty. So what should we take away from the story of this dysfunctional family? What are the truths that we can, can learn? Well, first truth I think we can learn is that a dysfun dysfunctional family is a broken family. Some symptoms of a dysfunctional family, estrangement, family members who can't stand each other and they try to avoid each other, anger, being mad at each other all the time, lack of trust, seeing fault in the patterns of communication so you can't really talk to each other, and deception, the, in the inability to really speak truth to any of the family members. Well, the second thing we can learn is there are consequences to sin. The end never justifies the means. I think everyone needs to ask the question, what are we willing to trade in life to get what we want? Are we willing to trade our family, our friends, our career, our children, our purity, our integrity? What kind of deal are we willing to make in order to get the things that we want? There really are no shortcuts to God. Every shortcut turns in to be a dead-end street. And those who do take shortcuts end up wandering aimlessly through life. God didn't need Jacob or Rebecca's help. God can work any miracle that he wants to. God has a million ways of accomplishing his purpose on earth. And when we interfere and we try to, quote, help God, we typically mess things up. And the ironic truth is that whenever we try to help God out, we may get what we want, but it may not be what we want to pay for. Then we learn that manipulators divide families. There are no shortcuts for blessings. If we force God's will or try to force God's will or blessings on someone or somebody, it will, we will lose it all. And those who impatiently try to force God's hand may get what they want, but in the process, they'll lose everything. I think that old adage of be careful what you pray for really is true. We can write it down in, I think, big, bold letters. God doesn't need our help to fulfill his will in our lives. Let me say that again. God does not need our help to fulfill his will in our lives. If God wants to give us a blessing, he can give it. If he wants to evaluate us, elevate us, he can do it. If he wants to raise us up to a position of great power, he can do that as well. Jacob was a blessed man with plenty of baggage. The good news is in Jacob's life is that dysfunctional people coming from dysfunctional families can in fact function in God's kingdom. More about Jacob's life, I think we're going to see in the future lessons from Genesis. When we turn fully to the Lord in his grace, he can rid us of all the baggage, transforming a sinful past into a source of ministry and blessings. Jacob finally did recognize his weaknesses, and he did place his faith back in God to protect him. But it was a long time coming. And although he often relied on himself, as in the past, he realized that the good things in his life were because God had a blessing for him and God was faithful to keep his promise. And God is sovereign and even uses man's own schemes and plans, just like he did with, with uh, Isaac and Rebekah, to accomplish his plan. So let me close with this. Sin always brings heartache and misunderstanding. You know, I had Rebekah and Isaac not taking the sides with their boys, favoring one over the other, had they continued to pray about what God's will was in all of this, his way, the whole event could have been avoided completely and God could have been glorified. As it was, all of them suffered because of their unbelief and disobedience. We never get too old to be tempted or to fail. 
God loved Jacob in spite of the fact that he failed, despite the fact that he was a sinner. He didn't deserve God's love, but God loved him, and he loved him in a way to demonstrate for us, even today, that God can love anyone that he chooses. This is the way it works with each of us who have put our faith and trust in Jesus. We don't come into the world looking for God. If God had not sought us before we sought him, we probably would have never sought him. If God had not chosen us before we chose him, he probably, we would probably not have chosen him. But praise God, because of his eternal plan, he did, in fact, choose us. Thanks, Ken. We all need to be reminded <clears throat> God's got a plan, and he's going to fulfill that plan, right? So we've got uh, fewer prayer requests this week. God's been answering some prayers. So first of all, birthdays. Joe's going to be a year older this week on the 19th, Tuesday. So, uh, and uh, Annette Flores has a birthday this week. <clears throat> Two in the class have birthdays. Karen Brumbley is doing very well with all the treatment and things that she's going through. She's taking <clears throat> radiation and chemo at the same time, and she finishes the <clears throat> radiation tomorrow, the first round. And the doctors are encouraged that it's making a difference and helping, so continue to pray for Karen Brumley. She's got a sister and a daughter that are taking care of her and getting her back and forth, so she needs our prayers, and if you know her, contact her and let her know <clears throat> that you're praying for her. Cheryl, Sherry Anders, Eris, Sherry Eris is um, home recovering. Her knee surgery replacement went good. Everything turned out good, and she's at home recovering, so continue to remember Sherry. <clears throat> Man, the allergies. My wife can't talk at all, so, you know, that. well, that's a blessing. <laughs> that, uh, no, that's good. I, I'm, 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 uh, this was for your wife. <clears throat> well, you this, can... uh, this is for my wife. That's the only thing. <laughs> but... Yeah, Joyce can't talk, but um, she sent me today, okay? But uh, remember, Sherry, in your prayers. And you saw the note that came out this week from Don about the man that attended car care this month. His name is Jesse Maharis, and he's a new believer, just been baptized in our church, and he shared his testimony about having this trigenal bralgia. The same thing that Roger has, where tremendous pain. And then he found out this last week that he has thyroid cancer on top of that. And so pray for Jesse, that God will use him. He's supposed to testify before Congress on the 18th about this uh, trigem trigeminal neuralgia or whatever. Anyway, you can read it in the prayer deal tonight. But pray for him that he'll be able to testify. Nelda Griffin. Nelda had carotid artery surgery. <clears throat> Things went well, but her blood pressure was up and down. Finally got it straightened out. She got to come home. She's doing well, and she thanks you for your prayers and all the things that you provided for her. So, <clears throat> Charlie Brown. Lenora and Tommy's friend, we prayed for him for some time. He's still in a skilled nursing facility, uh, but he's doing some better and needs strength and encouragement. Cheryl Duke, she used to be a member of our class. She's in Montana. She still has breathing problems, and uh, we need to pray for the correct treatment and healing and relief. Trish Jones and her daughter and Mary Jane are going to Kenya 
next month, and you've seen in the prayer list on Sunday night the things that they need to take with them so they can minister over there. They'll take cash or the things that are listed. So I'm not going to read those off, but uh, Wendell will have it in the prayer list tonight. And if you can help, try to get those things to Trish by the 7th of April so they can get things packed and ready to go. Charlotte Berg is a new care group leader, and one of her care group is Wilma Wilder. Wilma's not here, is she? She says she's... <coughs> Wilma uh, fell last summer, and she has all kinds of problems. She's got a rotator cuff that was damaged, her knee and her foot, and several other injuries on her left side of her body. And she needs us to pray that the, the insurance will be approved so she can have a hip replacement as soon as the, the insurance is approved. Wilma has a son and daughter that lives in the area, but Charlotte's been looking after her, so <clears throat> pray for Wilma in your prayers. There were two deaths in the family this week. One <clears throat> is a, I will get into it. Well, one is um, a Spanish pastor staff member on our, on our staff. His father died. Better. And Sally Rogers, I don't know if you know Rip and Sally Rogers, <clears throat> but Sally died um, pretty quickly. I mean, it was a real surprise this last two weeks. Her visitation will be tonight at Klein Funeral Home, and the funeral will be in the morning in the chapel, if you know Rip and Sally Rogers. Okay? That's it. Anybody have another need? Yes, ma'am. Her name. Okay. Would you write that down? Uh, I, we've got some prayer lists. I need to get that to Wendell. But if you'll just write that down. Remember Tara, her daughter, is going to have gallbladder surgery tomorrow in the medical center. Yes. Okay. Paul's fu Hillman, is that, yeah, I, I read that. Funeral next Saturday. Okay, let's pray together. Lord Jesus, thank you for knowing all of these requests before we even mentioned them. Thank you that you're already working, but we want to agree with you that we're concerned about these things. We ask that you would <clears throat> show yourself strong in each life, that you'll bring healing, that you'll bring encouragement, that you'll bring the things that are needed to meet those needs. And I pray that people will be able to trust and rely upon you because you love them. Lord, we thank you that we can join together and study your word and pray together and encourage each other. And I pray that during the week when we're not together that we realize that people are praying for us, concerned about us, and loving us because we're part of this life group. Bless us this week to serve you better. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I didn't see it.